<laughs> hey, I'm John John from Troop, keeping the music alive. Yo, my name is John John from Troop. They actually call me Jay Jizzle. Yo, keeping the music alive. How you been? How's the summer been treating you? Uh, hot. <laughs> <laughs> Where yeah. are you based? You you live in uh, California? Yeah. Cool, man. It's a real pleasure. I'm a big fan of yours. And oh, I'm really you, happy man. that you subscribe to our channel. Yeah. And that's how we got in touch, which is amazing. Thank you so much, yeah. man. So, um, John, John, tell me a little bit about how you first started in the music business. I know you come from a musical family, right? You grew up in yeah. church doing music. Yeah. Tell us a bit about that, man. Well, uh, yeah, I started singing at an early age with my family, uh, I guess around the age of three and, you know, picking up some bongos and playing that and, you know, and then playing drums, I guess around the age of seven, but always singing with the family and everything. We always sang at church all the time. Um, you know, my mom, my, my brother and two sisters, we would always get around with mom and just sing at church like it was sun up to sundown that's all i really did you know as a child up until my um you know my youth years as well too uh a lot of singing at church being in choirs and stuff like that so yeah that's that's where it all came from sounds amazing how did that translate to your career when did you kind of uh start in the music business how old were you i i think um i joined the guys uh, between the ages of 16 and 17 or whatever, um, so, somewhere around that age. But uh, I, I'd always been influenced by, you know, R&B music and, you know, even just growing up in the house. We would always play R&B music, you know. Yeah. But um, it was a friend of mine, uh, Stephen Russell, which one of the lead singers of the group. Um, I, I, I knew him for a lot of years but not knowing that he had anything, the ability to be able to sing or anything like that. Yeah. So when he started singing, it just kind of like blew my mind. And I, I kind of kept it on a on a hush hush, not really letting people know that that's what I did. Because, you know, I, my mom used to make us sing every Sunday. You know, she used to just make us, you know, what it didn't matter what we were doing. We'd be outside playing or whatever. And we had to stop doing all of that just to come inside to rehearse. So that's just all we did from sun up, sun up to sundown, we just rehearsed all the time. And it kind of just like, it ran me away from singing. So I used to just, I got into basketball, started playing basketball. And I played that just, you know, all the time. And, I, and it just kind of basically kept me away from being with the family and singing all the time. But when I ran into Steve and I heard him sing, it kind of like just blew my mind. And I was like, wow, man, I sing too. And he was like, really? Cause he had sang a song to this girl over the phone. It was a Michael Jackson record. He sang uh, "Lady in My Life," and I, you just, you were just doing a really good job. And I was like, "Wow, man! Like, like, man! Like, you really good, man." <laughs> and I, I, I told him, I said, "Man, I don't keep it. I don't let nobody know. I, I keep it quiet." I said, "Man, I sing too." He said, "You sing?" I said, "Yeah, I sing with my brother, my two son, my two sisters, my mom. We sing at church all the time." He was like, "Man, you sing with your family?" I said, "Yeah." So. <laughs> Uh, so I sang a song to him by O'Brien and uh, the song was called Lady I Love You and he was like whoa man you got some pipes man you can blow <laughs> so that night I said a prayer to God I said God I like Steve I think he's real cool I said we're doing a whole bunch of dancing right now with uh, you know these kids because we used to do Thriller then we would do Beat It and then he would go ahead and turn it out and do Billie Jean so he was he was bad you know he was real bad so that kind of like just blew my mind that he could sing. So I told God that night, I was like, hey, man, I said, I think I think Steve is real cool. I said, uh, we, you know, will you be able to do something with us later on in life? And that was it. That wow, was my man. prayer. And Rodney's mother had a dream of her son of, of being on stage with four of his friends. And pretty much that prayer and, and dream kind of basically matched and the rest is history. Wow, man, that's amazing. So you're a very spiritual person, right? Yeah. And uh, is it a, like a common thing in the in the group? Were you all like that in troop? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and if we wasn't, Rodney's mother, she made sure of it. She didn't play <laughs> around. Okay, okay. Yeah. So uh, tell me about your uh, first album. How, how did it all come about? You know, your first record and your first demos. Did you do demos before you 
you do demos to submit to record labels how did that all come about uh we, we did so many demos uh a lot of demos between probably a good 30 to 40 records that you know maybe only one of them uh that we had worked on made that first record and okay. then after that you know uh sylvia rome she teamed us up with people like gerald laverde and chucky booker and and uh wayne nelson and dennis vaughn and you know they kind of actually helped us to get the rest of the record together and, and along also with uh zane giles um but she came out to a uh our management um, had got in contact with them once. Once after we finished doing like, uh, once after Rodney's group had gotten together to do the show, putting on the hits. After that, pretty much it, it turned into a singing group, and because a producer had called the show and wanted to know if the guys could really sing, which was Greg Pere. Greg Pere was a producer. He did a lot of stuff with Michael Henderson. He worked with the Jacksons. Um, he actually, he played with Tito on the song "Time Waits for No One" on uh, the Jackson's Triumph album. Oh, I love that and, song! Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah, so that kind of like you know that fired us up to be able to work with someone who had worked with the Jacksons, you know. So at that time, it was myself, Rodney, Reggie, Steve, and a guy named Shane, and we auditioned for Greg Pere, and he put us in the studio. We did a couple of songs. We did an um an audition, like a showcase for uh, a and Records. And, okay. our, you know, we were kind of still wet behind the ears and everything. So we, we kind of didn't get that situation. And one of the guys, Shane, he actually got impatient, so he stopped coming around. That's how Alan had gotten to the group. Greg had a situation that was going on with his family, and he turned us over to David Cook and Steve Cohen. And we auditioned for them, and then they got us to deal with Atlantic Records. How old were you at this point? About 18, 19, about, I hadn't graduated from high school yet. Wow. So it was, it was around, it was around like 1986 when we got the deal with Atlantic, and we came out two years later uh, with Mama Sita, and we couldn't actually come out until after Steve had graduated from high school. I had to graduate from high school first, and then Steve graduated the following year in, in 88. And then we pretty much took off from there. Wow. So Chucky Booker, he was already involved in the first uh, demos and yeah. an album? Okay. No, not not the demos. Um, when we started asking questions uh, to our record label about how we wanted to um, work with producers like Jimmy Jam and Terry Lewis, and Sylvia said, I, got some, I have someone who's exactly like those guys and, and that's how we got involved uh, to be with chucky wow man the song all i do is think of you how did it come about how did you pick that song was it you guys who came together to pick it i mean you were obviously uh, jackson five fans absolutely everybody yeah everybody was all jackson five fans um uh we all just you know love and adore those guys and uh i just remember always playing the song you know, and letting the guys hear the record and always just thought that it would be a great record for us to do. Yeah, yeah. And Steve used to always talk to Sylvia about just whatever. And, and I told him, I said, man, you need to take this record up to Sylvia and see if we can go ahead and record it. Yeah, yeah. And we ended up doing it and uh, <laughs> it became life changing for us. It's funny because I heard your version, funnily enough. Mm -hmm. Before I, and I, we're big Michael Jackson and Jackson Five Motown fans. Of course, yeah. and I heard your version before I even knew the Jacksons had recorded it, and I really loved wow. your your version of it, man. It's the music Thank video you, and the the song, man. It's fantastic. The whole instrumental is like incredible. It's really inspirational, and I'm totally being honest, man. Wow, uh, Thank, that's how I know man. you. That's how I know you guys. I was in high school, so uh -huh. towards the end of high school. I heard about you guys and I was amazed, man, because I, I had never really, you know, I never heard of you guys because we, we're from Europe, right? So all of the stuff from mm -hmm. America, we we, right. we don't really get it. But but the fact is, you guys in America, you guys are huge, right? And it's a wonderful song. So um, after that, spread your wings. Tell me a bit about that song. It's also a really, I, I love that song as well, man. It's a beautiful song. We, we want it. Uh, the song that Chucky had did on himself, which was his demo to um, Turned Away. And that's the song that we wanted. 
and we were trying to, you know, to get with him to go ahead and record that song. And Sylvia said, it's going to go on Chucky's record. She said, you guys are going to have to go ahead and get back with him and, and just, you know, come up with something else. And so, you know, we told him, hey, man, you got to get back in the lab and come up with something like Turned Away. And that's how Spread My Wings came about. What year did it come out? What was 89, it? 89, 90. So you basically had two back-to-back -back major hits, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that kind of catapulted you guys to another level. Yeah. And you kind of at the forefront of the new Jack Swing, right? I wouldn't say that because no? Teddy Riley was, he was just, you know, he was the guy that actually started that whole entire phrase of new Jack Swing. And, and it was just, it was big what he was doing when he re had released Guy. I mean, yeah, yeah. he already started it when he was doing hip hop, you know, when he was producing people like Dougie Fresh and Big Daddy Kane. And oh, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Before he started to do the Guy stuff merging like r&b and hip-hop together and i think that's what really new jack swing really is it's like you know because he was he was producing a lot of uh hip-hop artists and everything and, and just giving them those really nice tight you know flexible beats and everything and just merge singing with it and i think that would i think that would be the, the cause of it to call it uh i, I wouldn't call it hip-hop and r&b i would call that new jack swing yeah okay so yeah. who are your major influences like growing up like obviously i guess the jackson five yeah absolutely but uh, who else i mean you have a special tone to your voice what is oh, that thank like you, a man. natural thing is it a family thing or is it something you developed from listening to certain people um it, it it developed i think once i turned a certain age at around like 14 something like that like right around the the time when I was getting ready to join the group, my voice had just, it just, you know, it dropped. It just went somewhere else from where it was at in the beginning because I was doing a lot of falsetto stuff and singing mid-range stuff and everything. And all of a sudden it's just, you know, but the funny thing is that as growing up as a child, I did play a lot of music like Hell Melvin and the Blue Notes, oh, yeah. Isaac Hayes and Barry White. I used to always play their music all the time. Shaft is still like my number one favorite soundtrack, you know, still up to date because of the music is so awesome. And then, of course, you have Barry White with his Love Unlimited edition music and everything. It's just it's incredible. Yeah. So I used to always just listen to their music all the time, not really knowing that my voice would go somewhere in a mature sound, you know. So it was kind of weird to me and, and kind of frightening all to me at the same time, because, you know, here I'm this young guy and, and at the same time, my voice is just started to get deep out of nowhere. Yeah, it's funny because you have these low, deep tones, but then at the same time you have a huge range. I was seeing something of you guys at the Polo Theater, and you're just okay. like, woo! Oh, wow, <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, man. Yeah, yeah. man, I can, I can yeah. definitely see some sort of connection there. Tell mm. me a bit about um, this single you released. It's a tribute to, to Luther Vandross, right? Oh uh, yeah, too never much. too much. Yeah, yeah, I love that song, man. Okay. Tell me about it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, I was uh, wow, I'm glad you guys got it. Cool, man. That's that's that, that's what's up. Um, yeah, it's just Luther. I've always loved Luther. His voice was just always amazing, still amazing today. A lot of people say, you know, he's was. Nah, not if if we still have the material, it'll never be a was. It'll always be is because we get to listen to it anytime that we choose to listen to it. So it'll always be just relevant and just a wonderful sound that he's always had. So, uh, but I've always just, you know, his music has always been incredible. My brother and my sisters, and they used to always play his music and, and it just kind of like, it just did something to me, you know? And his singing voice is just, you know, he's amazing. And, Intact, and uh, right? like yeah, I, I but I was I was trying to have some other people to go ahead to do the track with me, and it didn't um, it didn't pan out the way that it, that it was supposed to in the in the beginning. But it was cool how it came out because when I was talking to the guy Damone Arnold, he was asking me. He said, "Man, what do you want to do?" I said, "Man, I want to do it. I want to go ahead and do a tribute to Luke. I want to do Never Too Much." And uh, the, the crazy thing about that, if you listen very carefully, you can actually hear Luther's background vocal singing too much, never too much, never too much. Okay. Well, he had had that and he was getting ready to get rid of it. 
And so when I told him, he was like, wow. He said, he said, uh, he went to his computer and he rubbed his hands together and he was, and he hit a button and all all you hear was Luther all by himself. Whoa. He said, this is, he said, this is what we can do. He said, we can take Luther's voice and put it with your vocals. It'll be like Luther singing on your record. I was <laughs> like, Whoa. So yeah, it was great, man. So yeah, cool, Luther's man. voice is definitely on there. Wow. Man. Did you ever get to meet Luther? Yes. Uh, I bet you did, at, yeah. yeah. At the fourth annual Soul Train Awards, he was one of the hosts. He was a really nice guy. R really nice guy. Cool, yeah. man. Hey, guys. Welcome back to the show. My name is Danny Alex. I want to remind you, don't forget to subscribe to us on YouTube. So on YouTube, we've got the Brothers Gram, which is our name for this channel. And then we have Indie Pop Records, where we put some other stuff as well. We also share these videos as well. Instagram, which is also the Brothers Gram. So it's all written below. Can't go wrong. Not difficult. Just follow us, like us, subscribe to us, comment, let us know what you think. Stay safe. Peace. What have you been up to recently? Um, Some more recording working with uh this uh a friend of mine his name is d levance uh actually i've been knowing d levance for a lot of years he's a musician um i'm working with him now on one of my songs he's doing some additional production to it the name of the song is called love peace joy and happiness so we kind of had to go ahead and redo uh you know redo the vocals and everything uh originally produced by my boy you know my boy paco schwartz uh okay really cool cat written by another friend of mine myself and Derek Bradford so we're working on that song as we speak and you know and some other songs that I'm getting ready to go ahead and and, and finish up like the the remix to cover girl just got released okay um features a girls group uh by the name of X and this rapper uh Beach J uh great record a friend of mine uh, Marcus Buchanan and Mike Gr Michael Gray are executive producers for the song i think the song and the music video just got just put out like i think like this week okay man so yeah. it, it, will it be it's on your youtube i guess yeah the music video the music video is not out right now okay. but the uh the remix to uh to cover girl is out right now on youtube yeah cool so the do you know when this music video will come out so people can check it out like probably in a week or two or do you have probably in about yeah basically like about a, about a week or two yeah about a cool, week man. So tell me your opinion about the music business. What's the state of it, in your opinion? How's how's it going along, and where is it going? Where is it going? I'm not sure. Where is it going? Um, <laughs> I, I, I I pray that everybody just keep doing whatever that it is that God has called them to do with this music, so we can still be able to stand the test of time. That's what I really pray for. That everybody is still just doing, you know, just using the gift that God gave them to. To, to go ahead and, and keep, cre you know, keep recreating, keep creating, you know, that's my prayer, of, prayerfully, uh, hopefully a, a where to go. I mean, like, um, we're like in the sample era, right? Everyone's sampling. Yeah, everybody, Old everybody is sampling. You guys everybody are not, sampling. How many <laughs> times have you been sampled, man? <laughs> Hundreds wow. of times, thousands uh, of times? I guess a few times, uh, especially with the song, I Will Always Love You. Yeah, Fat Joe and Chris Brown, you know, they, they did something to it. I like it. it, it the, actually, there's a remix that we actually recorded ourselves. So the remix actually is like true Fat Joe and Chris Brown. So it's really cool. Yeah, yeah. Like so it, you, yeah. all these uh, these songs that you guys recorded, a lot of them had your hand in them, right? You Lyrically or not, compositional wise, or it depended on the situation? It didn't become really like a full troop situation until like i would say maybe the third album which steve had a lot of hand in it as far as like a lot of the production um but like on our first two albums you know actually musically it was he didn't do anything musically he did some writing you know with alan and they did a song called still in love okay and i believe steve also had wrote another song called watch me dance on the first album as well too and then that and then uh he also wrote a song called young girl which was uh produced by zach Harmon. then he did start doing a little bit more until the second album i think he had a lot of handing in about maybe five songs in the second album and the third album was when he just like pretty much took off and okay. it was just like you know had a lot of writing on the first three tracks, which was, you know, keep you next to me. She blows my mind. I'm not gaming. Uh, and then, and then, you know, just turned it to a serious 
producing based on a lot of the songs from that album. Like, you know, uh, Only When I Laugh, uh, the record that he had did on me, You Take My Heart With You, um, Come Back To Your Home. Uh, I think he, he co-produced along with Alan when they did uh, Whatever It Takes To Make You Stay. Let's see. I mean, he just, you know, he produced the LP version to Sweet November. Uh, Babyface did the remix, but pretty much, you know, it's just been like almost like, you know, he gets these songs that God gives him, and then all of a sudden he sits, you know, he sits down with us and he tells us, what do we think? And, and we give him the yay or nay if it's okay. a good one or what's not. You know, it, he, it, it's not like he just gets to always just get a song on a record. It has to pass through, you know, yeah, like yeah, we yeah. have to like really like it for it to, you know, be a part of the record. Well, it's for you guys. Part, um, Give yeah. him the possibility yeah. and at yeah. the same time kind of be demanding with the, the quality. Yeah, and yeah, for yeah. the most part of it, he's been he's been a okay. He's been really good. <laughs> he's been really good. Cool man. So in your career, you got you're still a young man, you've got plenty of time to go. But if you had the moment in your career, what would be the highlight? Well, my my I think my highlights have pretty much already came. Well, you know, with meeting, you know, a lot of people like meeting the Jacksons and meeting Luther Vandross and meeting my favorite gospel group of all time, the Winans. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. And meeting, um, I mean, you know, meeting everybody pretty much. But, but I would think my high, high, high life would be for the group to be able to do a a biopic, like a movie on the group. I think oh, that yeah, would be yeah, like yeah. the highlight. Yeah. I think that will make, that makes a lot of sense considering yeah. other bands in the same yeah. genre have done it you know right i mean you're definitely right. up there with them man i saw some some stuff of you guys touring are you have you been touring did you have to stop because of this well obviously with the pandemic nah, nah, nah. you know it hurt us all you know what i mean so but you know we were doing spot dates in between and um and now uh we just kind of like pick back up a little bit of, of doing some more spot dates and we just got back from dayton ohio like this past weekend and we, uh, another weekend before that, we were in uh, South Bend, Indiana. Uh, October the 16th, we'll be in um, San Leandro, California with High Five. All right, that's, our, that's our buddies right there, High Five. We'll be with them. Um, I'm doing something uh, in Malibu uh, with a partner of mine, Stevie Dreamer, uh, putting on a, a concert over here in Malibu. I'll be performing with a friend of mine. Um, Alex Thomas, the comedian, will be hosting it. A friend of mine, uh, Brooklyn James, we, which me, me and Brooklyn have a few songs together. Yeah, I so we, exactly yeah, have a single concert. Brooklyn, yeah. Yeah, we, we're, we're going to be in concert on the 17th of October. Um, so, yeah, so there's some other dates that, you know, that, that are coming up for the group and everything. So, yeah. So you've been, you know, considering you have been pretty active and you looks like yeah. you're going to continue. And you yeah. guys bring in the crowds. I mean, I was seeing videos like guys pack theaters man loads of people yeah. singing your songs man fantastic thanks thanks man we so, gotta get back out to london too man we haven't been to london wales in a long time wow man that would yeah. be amazing london wales yeah to do uh and, and, and you guys Amsterdam. should do uh, mm. you guys should do um join up with a few of your you know friend bands and come over to europe and do a huge tour because i mean yeah, you guys be to be honest i think there's a lack of of all that all that all this good music here in europe and they're yeah. all you guys do have loads of fans i know that man around yeah. france uh, england germany so that would I mean, be great man we'll be uh praying that yeah. you guys come yeah. over yeah john so a bit more to into the production side okay um what's the vibe in the studio in those first days how was it for you i mean you were 18 years old i mean let's just all say these <laughs> wow i mean because the remember you have to remember on the first album we worked with this in with this great great songwriter producer mu musician that actually worked with prince in the revolution oh okay brown mark okay i mean he if anyone i would say he was the guy who had taught us how professional that you would have to be when you're recording vocals very professional no nonsense the job has to get done and it has to be done at a certain time and in a certain way he did not play at all he was he was he was man for real 
this was uh before the digital era so it was all done yes analog the reels <laughs> yeah yeah because you guys are known for a lot of vocals right yeah. i mean how, yeah. how long was it would it be a whole day would you sometimes come back and redo some stuff not not really because what what kind of basically took a long time at first to repeat the background vocals all the time all over again especially oh yeah to, yeah yeah to exactly. the vamp of the song that was before they had the thing called flying in vocals okay so you fly in vocals now which is it's, it's a no-brainer it's real yeah. fast now so yeah like in those days you have to record all the back vocals yeah you have to sing it section. over and over and over yeah, and yeah. then you have to go ahead and dub that note and do that over and over <laughs> i mean it was it was deep especially working with people with like who had eight track studios or four track studios okay. You really had to go ahead and just sing it over and over and over and over, sing it over and over and over. It was deep, man. Yeah, it was yeah, deep. Yeah, yeah. It was um, deep. But we learned a whole lot, though. And did you like? Would you each one record separately, or would you record sometimes together? Like some, sometimes, some. It, I guess uh, it was both. Uh, it was it was both sometimes. Sometimes it was by you know either Alan would go in by himself, and I would go in go in and stack his note. Uh, so sometimes it was sometimes it was like that too. How were the touring back in the day? Was, was it like exhausting? And considering you were a young kid, right? Fun, man. A lot of work. Funny story though. Rodney's brother Tony, he became one of our securities on the road, so he came to hang out and be with us. And what he did was was really funny. We got to the hotel. He took his clothes out of his suitcase and put it into a drawer. We were like, dude, what are you doing, man? <laughs> and he did that for about maybe two or three nights. He said, after that, <laughs> that's, that's how we live. We live out of the suitcase, you know? Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. That's a rookie mistake, right? Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> so how long did these tours last for? So between three to five to seven months at a time. Yeah. Sometimes that would, and that would be like maybe one leg of the tour. Then you go back home, you rest up for about maybe maybe 30 days you have to go right back out again this generation of you know r b artists which they they mix up a lot of stuff nowadays with hip-hop and trap and who who are the guys you listen to it's it's really hard man um you would have to throw some names at me because the <laughs> people i love uh those those people that, that you know they came out after we came out and i think they did really good i like music soul child i mean music soul child is awesome you know, D'Angelo, uh, you have uh, Raheem Devon, um, you have even Maxwell. Uh, these, these people have kept it going, but then you, there's been some other people that has come across and it's like, wow, this is this is what we have to be, this is, this is what we have to listen to. Sometimes, sometimes I feel as if like, you remember that movie with Militia Man? Yeah. When they go and get, and they get them out of, out of prison, Sylvester is sitting in the car and they're playing some music that sounds like really, really crazy, but it's the music for that time. Yeah, that's yeah, how yeah. I that's how I feel sometimes <laughs> with some of these artists. It's like, wow, we have to be, you know, this is what this is what it is. Okay. It's I, a trick. I have man. I have the same uh, feeling. <laughs> the yeah. feeling is neutral. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Listening to bands like yours and all those, you know, those generations of music just like never ending is so rich, right? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. John, John. Yes, sir. Um, I want to thank you very much for doing this interview. I appreciate it, man. Maybe thank you guys we could, so much uh, for having me, man. We were big fans. I hope we could do a second episode in you a few months. Um, you got it. You got it. And I wish you continued success, and I wish you a lot of touring because you guys deserve it. You guys make fantastic music. And, thank um, you, man. I would just like to ask you to say two phrases for me, if possible. <laughs> and okay. I think you know which, which phrases they are. <laughs> <laughs> so the first phrase is, hey, my name is John John, and you're watching In The Pocket with the Brothers. Yeah. Yeah, what's up, everybody? This is your man, John John, from the R&B Group Troop, and you're watching In The Pocket with the Brothers. Yeah! yeah. Great, man. You're one of the... First people who do it on the first take. Oh, not, <laughs> not bad. Thank you so much. It's a huge pleasure, man. The everything was great. That was great. Let's keep in touch. Ah, uh, yeah, let's do that. All the All best, right. my brother. Are right, you got my man?
<sighs> hey guys, if you want to see more content like this, don't. <laughs> Hi right, guys, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like and subscribe to our channel, so, um, yeah, do it again. <laughs> Hey guys, if you... <laughs> subscribe to this channel, okay. <laughs>